thank you, Paul. I'm uh, very excited. I can be part of this uh, course that you're giving. And as you said, you know, eight leading experts on C-mounts and plate motion. I think that's very exciting. And so I decided, of course, to stick with my own topic of research, which is argon-argon dating of C-mounts. Uh, but that might give um, a nice counterbalance to all the plate motion modelers and PO magneticians that are part of this uh, lecture series. So basically, my talk is about 40 argon, 39 argon geochronology and applied to seamount trails. And today, I would in particular talk about uh, the eight systematics of the Samoan, Gilbert Ridge, Tokelau, and Louisville uh, seamount trails. Uh, they are all part of the Pacific Ocean. And as you can see on this map, uh, that there are quite a lot of seamounts um, that are uh, present there. And all the red spots, that's basically any feature that is higher than 500 meters on the ocean floor. So next slide, please. So I just want to go back a little bit in time and look at some early explorations. Uh, the Pacific Ocean has been visited by quite some people and explorers and scientists starting basically five centuries ago. However, at that time, the explorers, they didn't really were that much interested in looking at seamounts. They just wanted f to find some new land and do some navigation. And so basically, seamounts were not known for a very long time. And even when the HMS Challenger from, from England started to sail around the oceans of the world in 1872, Actually, they didn't focus on finding any uh, features on the ocean floor. And so it took until the Second World War, which is on the next slide. Um, it took until the world, Second World War before we discovered some seamounts on the ocean floor. Harry Hess, a very famous professor from around that era, was actually sailing as um, one of the um, officers uh, from the hydrographic office of the US Navy at the time on one of the, the warships in the Pacific Ocean. And he was able to use one of the first echo sounders at that time. And the picture or the profile you see here on this slide is actually one of the first uh, depictions of a seamount by one of such an echo sounder. And this is 1942 and this was published in one of his seminal uh, papers at that time. So go to the next slide please. So if we go back to this map now of the Pacific Ocean, um, again, there's many, many seamounts, all the red dots that you can see here. Um, but we also now know something else about those seamounts. Uh, we know that quite often they are linked together in trails or in chains, and we call those uh, seamount trails. And of course, the Hawaiian Emperor Seamount Trail is one of the most famous seamount trails around the world. It's also one of the longest. It's reflecting volcanism for about 80 million years. In the Pacific Ocean, there's another seamount trail called the Louisville that's actually in the South Pacific that is, has been active for the same uh, period of time, also around 80 million years or 70 million years to be precise. Um, and so that's another very uh, important seamount trail. However, if you look to all the other seamount trails depicted here, just a selection uh, by the light blue lines, you see that most of them are actually pretty short of length. And if you would put that in a histogram, you would actually see that most seamount trails do not have volcanic activity going longer than 30 or 40 million years. So that's pretty interesting. Uh, another important fact is, is if you hear scientists talk about seamounts, they most often talk about the Pacific Ocean. And that's because most of the seamounts and of the hotspot trails or seamount trails are actually located over there. So for this talk, I would mainly focus, uh, or actually only focus, on the Pacific Ocean today. Next slide, please. So if we zoom in a little bit, and here we're looking at a gravity anomaly map uh, made by Dave Sandwell and Walter Smith. Uh, you, have, you, know that, you know those guys by now. Um, but if we focus in on the Hawaiian Emperor, you can see, you know, it's very, it's very uh, clear in this map where that seamount trail is lying. It has uh, big gravity anomalies where the islands and the seamounts are. It's surrounded by what's called a gravity moat. It's the, the pink stuff, the pink color around those seamounts. Um, it's basically where the plate is indented a little bit by the weight of those features. 
And if you look at the young end of the Orion Emperor Trail, you actually can see a slight lithospheric swell, and uh, Dave Sandwell talked about that a few days or a week ago. If you then look to the southwest of this map, the southwest end, you see many, many other seamounts in very complex configurations. And the one in the southwest of this map are actually the West Pacific Seamount Province uh, Seamounts, and they were part of my PhD study, actually. I'm not going to talk about that today, but they are a very complex set of seamounts that are between 70 and 140 million years old, um, and they're very interesting to study. So if we go to the next slide, we go actually a little bit south to the South Pacific, and you see if you look at this map, the whole feature looks much different. The seamount trails are much smaller, I mean the, the seamounts themselves are much smaller. There are also not that many seamounts, it's quite uh, bare in terms of seamounts here. But you can see a few seamount trails very easily. So in the bottom left corner you can see the Louisville Seamount Trail, which is uh, going towards the northwest where it intersects with the, uh, the Tonga Trench where actually the Pacific Plate is subducted and the Louisville Seamount Trail is subducted as well. If you go a little bit more up north along this uh, subduction zone, you come to the Samoan Trail, which is uh, one of the Seamount Trails I'm going to talk about in a minute. So let's go to the next slide. So well, most likely you guys have seen this from your textbooks. Um, Seamount trails are very interesting because most of them are located far away from the plate tectonic, plate tectonic boundaries. And because of that, we need a very special mechanism to explain them. And in most textbooks, you can find what's called the hotspot model or the mantle plume model, where some hot mantle plume material is rising from deep in the earth. And while it's rising vertically, at some point it will interact with the oceanic lithosphere where it will basically start flattening out and because of decompression it can start melting and that melt can then basically penetrate through the lithosphere and form a volcano like the uh, volcanoes of Hawaii and that's depicted here in the top left. Uh, we also know, you know, we've got plate tectonics so plates are actually moving or rotating over the earth so that's the picture on the right where if you have this hotspot or mantle plume rising over a long period of time, it actually forms seamount after seamount, uh, which gets transported away from that hotspot location in the direction of plate motion. And so that's basically the textbook hotspot model. And it's a very simple model and it gives us some really nice predictions. Um, for example, assuming that a mantle plume or a hotspot is fixed in the mantle, uh, the plate motion can be derived by looking at the direction that those seamount trails are pointing in and by looking at the age progressions that we can derive by measuring the ages for the seamounts. And so together, the direction of the seamount trail and the age progressions that we can calculate for the seamount trails, they allow us to calculate a, a model of absolute plate motion. And I'm, I'm certain that Paul has um, given you all kinds of detailed information on how to calculate that and all the different models and approaches that uh, are existent in the literature. So I'm not really going to focus on that. What I'm going to focus about is about the arc and arc and age dating. Uh, but before I do that, you know, we're just going to go to the next slide, which basically shows the same model again, but now in 3D, just a nice block diagram of Hawaii, the mantle plume, either coming from very deep in the lower mantle, maybe even from the core mantle boundary later, we don't know. Um, and go to the next slide. This is basically what I really want to talk about, is that that's the ages that we can uh, measure for the seamounts in the seamount trail. So this is a, uh, a map of the, a very simple map of the Hawaiian uh, ridge, basically. And plotted below that are the ages measured uh, probably about three decades ago by now. So this is a very old uh, data set with age dates. But what you could see and what researchers could see three decades ago is that those ages, they form a very nice uh, linear line uh, with distance from the hotspot. So the distance here is plotted on the horizontal axis 
And where it's zero on the right side, that's where the active volcanism is happening. That's where the hotspot presumably is located. And if you go to the left in the diagram, you go away from the hotspot and the ages of the seamounts or volcanoes, they increase. And they do that in a linear fashion. And people realize that in an ideal situation, you can use this information to calculate the speed of the rotation of the plate. Um, and so when people saw this data set, they thought, well, this seals the deal. You know, it basically uh, tells us that this hotspot model actually might work. Well, if we go to the next slide now, actually, since that time, scientists have been studying seamount trails in much greater detail. And we have improved a lot on also on our analytical techniques in terms of determining the ages. Um, so by now, we know that actually, in reality, seamount trails are way more complex. And um, the hotspot model is not that straightforward too. I mean, the der derivation of that. So here I just listed seven complexities uh, that I think are very interesting and uh, are now in the literature. So first of all, seamounts or volcanoes, hotspot volcanoes, sometimes take a very long time to grow. Some can do it in one or two million years. Others actually take quite some more time. And volcanism can happen on those hotspot volcanoes um, sometimes 10, years, 10 million years later than when that hotspot first started uh, to, be, to be built up. So that's, that's really making uh, the data set of, of ages for seamounts very complex and uh, important to know and keep, keep, keep in mind. Another thing that others are most likely going to talk about is about, is about global plate circuit model, models. Well, basically, if you have a fixed hotspot model and you have that for all the hotspots around the world, you can derive plate motions based on that for all the hotspots around the world. And you should be able to transfer that motion from, say, the hotspots in the Atlantic to the hotspots in the Pacific Ocean or from the hotspots in the Indian to the hotspots in the Pacific Ocean. And people have been doing this exercise repeatedly over the last few decades. The interesting thing, though, is in an ideal situation, you would expect that that famous band that is marking the Hawaiian Emperor Trail should be reproduced, no matter which kind of hotspot trail you are transferring from either the Indian or the Atlantic Ocean. Turns out that actually that's not the case. And I think um, maybe Dietmar Muller or, or either Bernard Steinberg is going to tell you some more about that later on. Another interesting fact is that um, scientists have been drilling the Emperor Seamounts a couple of years ago and determined based on paleomagnetism where the pale latitudes of those seamounts are. And John Taduno is most likely, or Will Sager is going to talk about that later on. Uh, for now, it's interesting just to know that during those ODP lag, during that ODP lag, they discovered that the Hawaiian hotspot most likely was not fixed at all between 80 million and 47 million years ago. And actually, there was a shift of 15 degrees from north to south. So, bottom line there is apparently that hotspot is not fixed at all. Other evidence comes from a numerical modeling uh, where scientists try to model um, confectional uh, regimes in the Earth's mantle. And from those models, we know that actually the convection is actually pretty vigorous. And if there are mantle probes uh, go from deep in the mantle up to the uh, oceanic lithospheres in the Pacific, it's very likely that those mantle plumes uh, will get deflected in what's called the mantle wind. And again, I think that's Bernard Steinberg is going to be talking about that. Um, I already told you that most seamount trails are pretty short-lived, particularly in the Pacific Ocean. There's, most of them do not show volcanic activity for more than 30 million years, which is a problem. Um, and then a lot of seamount trails, if you actually measure the ages with arc and arc and geochronology, uh, we have noticed that actually they don't show very nice linear age progressions. Or if we start looking at the bending of seamount trails, like the famous Hawaiian Emperor Band, and we try to 
look at bands that appear in other seamount trails in the Pacific Ocean, we actually have data now that shows that uh, those bands do not happen at the same time. And that's actually something you would expect in this ideal world of a fixed hotspot model, um, where the plate is just moving over, say, three or four hotspots that are active at a particular time. If the plate changes its rotation, um, each of those seamount trails that's being formed in that, that particular period should show the same band and it should show the band at exactly the same time. And then we're getting more and more evidence that actually there are other processes like stresses in the plate and extensions in the oceanic plates that might actually complicate the buildup of seamounts and with that the observed ages. So here basically in this whole list of complexities six out of the seven of those complexities they have to do something with ages and um, so that's why I put them up that here because I want to talk about age dating and seamount trails and so it's knowing the ages of the seamounts is actually a very key part of the uh, evidence that we need in studying seamount trails and discussing the hotspot model or talking about the mantle plume debate so I'm going to make a little sidestep here and that's going to the arc and arc and dating in the next slide. Um, so I don't know if anyone of you is familiar with arc and arc and dating, so I just put this up here to, to explain it a little bit. Um, arc and arc and dating is based on the decay series between potassium and argon. And in fact, potassium-40, the isotope of, of potassium, is decaying to two other isotopes. Uh, it has one branch that decays to 40 calcium and another branch that's decaying to 40 argon. Well, that's that latter branch that we are interested in and that we can actually use to derive an age for a seamount. And that branching of the decay is shown here in this particular diagram. If we go to the next slide, well, there's a very simple basic age equation listed here where basically T, which is the age, can be calculated with this particular equation where lambda is the decay constant of this particular potassium to argon decay scheme. And there's two other parameters that you need to know. That's D, which is the daughter isotope, and P, that's the parent isotope. So basically, if you know how much of the daughter isotope is present in your rock today, and you know how much of the parent isotope is left in your rock today, and you know the decay constant, you can actually um, calculate an age for a rock. So below that, I've listed the decay constant for this particular decay scheme. And so this, the, on the top is the one from 40 potassium to 40 argon. The second one is the one that goes to the branch 40 calcium. The total decay is basically the sum of those, the decay of those two branches, which is this number of 5.5 10 to the minus 10 per year, which is, that's the decay constant. That doesn't say too much. But you can also express the decay constant as a half-life. And a half-life is a very easy measure because it tells you how long it takes a half of your 40 potassium isotopes to decay to 40 arc. And as you can see, the half-life of this decay series is about 1.25 billion years which is quite, uh, quite some time. So on the next slide, um, I basically fill in those numbers into this basic decay uh, equation. The only complexity here is just that before this ratio 40 argon over 40 potassium, which is the daughter divided by the, present, uh, by the parent, sorry, uh, there is uh, another ratio is basically it's what we call the branching decay ratio, where you're basically correct for the fact that uh, part of the potassium isotopes decay to calcium. So this is a very simple situation. Um, this is a very interesting decay series because potassium is one of the most common major elements in both terrestrial and extraterrestrial materials. And for seamount basalts, it's very useful too because Seamount basalts are quite typically enriched in potassium, and so, um, in principle, 
they are easy targets for age dating. Uh, the half-life is very nice too because this 1.25 billion years half-life allows us to date rocks that are very old, almost like the age of the Earth, to rocks that are very young. Um, the seamounts in the Pacific Ocean are between zero and 140 million years, and so they are they, they are very easily dated using this technique. So in the next slide, there's this one complexity that I about arc and arc and dating. What I've shown you before in the equation is basically the uh, classical potassium argon dating method, and uh, not the argon argon method. In the potassium argon dating method, you basically have to know how much parent, that's the potassium isotope, is in your rock, and how much of the daughter isotope, that's the argon isotope. They both are, of course, two different elements, and so the measurement of that is very complex, because basically you have to make two different measurements, one for the potassium, one for the argon. Uh, you have to split your rock, which is not good. Um, and so they couldn't achieve a very good uh, precision with that technique. And alteration was also a problem um, because of the potassium, which is, uh, which is very uh, easily mobilized during the alteration process of the salts in the ocean. Um, however, at some point, scientists realized is that if you put sample a geological sample in a nuclear reactor and you bombard it with neutrons, you can artificially generate 39 argon from 39 potassium. Uh, 39 argon is an, is an artificial isotope that doesn't, so it doesn't exist in nature. Um, so basically, you can use this particular reaction in a nuclear reactor um, to get a proxy for how much potassium is in your rock by looking at the amount of 39 argon that is produced uh, during that uh, nuclear reaction. And so that makes it very useful uh, because at that point you can measure the 40 argon, which is the daughter isotopes, and you can measure the 39 argon, which is the proxy for potassium, and you can measure them with one measurement in a mass spectrometer, which makes the, uh, the resulting ages way more precise and hence um, that's why where we get the name 40 argon 39 eucronology from. That's how we uh, like to refer to our dating technique. So over the rest of the talk I will show you a few examples of this uh, dating technique and the results that we achieve with that. Um, there's one thing that we should think about is seamounts of course are all underwater and a lot of the volcanics are actually formed underwater too. Um, so, if a sample gets formed underwater and the basalt cools down under, say, a water column of five kilometers, which happens quite a lot, it means that actually that particular lava flow forms under quite some hydrostatic pressure. If it forms under that hydrostatic pressure, it means that it cannot very easily equilibrate with the atmosphere and it cannot really easily release the argon gas that's in the rock or in the magma as that is coming up from the Earth's mantle. And so here in this diagram, um, we're showing basically what happens if you are taking five samples from a pillow basalt that formed quite deep on the flanks of, the, of Kilauea basically, underwater. And so if you measure the age from the glasses that you sample from, from the pillow rim, which is on the left side, you actually measure an age of 43 million years, which is way older than you would expect. You expect an age of zero million years, of course. And the further you go down towards the core of the pillow basalts, the closer you get to the zero million years of this historic uh, lava flow. And so sampling of basalt lava from seamounts is pretty critical and you really have to look at what you sample. You should not sample pillow rim because of this particular um, excess argon that might still be residing in that particular sample. Another thing, of course, is seawater and hydrothermal alteration. Um, hyd both, both processes have the ability to either remove or add potassium 
to your basaltic samples. And since potassium is the parent isotope that you need in calculating the ages, that of course that's, that's not a very good thing and you have to try to avoid uh, any alteration, if at all possible, in your samples. So next slide. So now basically I'm going to talk about three seamount trails, uh, one by one, and I'm starting out with the Samoan Seamount Trail. It's a very short seamount trail. It's there in the, in the mid-Pacific, and it's located very closely to a plate tectonic boundary. And it's located very closely to the Tonga Trench where the Pacific Plate is, subduction, is subducting. It actually has active volcanism. There's one volcano called Vailulu that's very active, and it has been forming volcanic cones uh, as recent as two, two years ago. Um, However, this seamount trail for a very long time has been like a type example of a seamount trail that most likely was not formed by a hotspot. And so it's very interesting in that respect. And we decided to go out and take a closer look at the seamount trail. So next slide. So if we zoom in and we look at a bathymetric map of the Samoan uh, hotspot, you see here on the map a seamount called Failululu. That's that active seamount or volcano I was talking about. And towards the left or towards the west, um, there's quite a few islands, with the oldest island being Savai'i. That's that light gray blob there in the middle of the map. Um, and then if you go even further to the west, there's quite a bunch of uh, seamounts that are also part of this seamount trail. Um, however, I'm interested in the ages. And so below on the bottom left, I plotted the ages as we knew it, like uh, a couple of years ago before we went out to sea to collect more samples. And we've plotted the ages against distance from the hotspot again. So where the distance is zero, that's where Failulu is, of course, that's where the hotspot is. And then we also plotted a blue line, which is the basically a constant speed of the Pacific Plate of 7.1 centimeters per year. But what you can see very clearly here is that if you look at the gray, uh, sorry, the, the square symbols here, which are the ages that we, that we knew five years ago, most of them are actually falling decidedly below that uh, age progression line from a simple plate motion model. Um, however, we noticed as well is that all those ages, or most of those ages, were actually derived from uh, land samples basically on those islands, Savai, Upulu, and Tutuila, and some even younger islands towards the, towards the east. So we, so we thought, what if you would sample those seamounts uh, underwater at their base, basically, like four or five kilometers deep? Would you actually get an older age uh, that would fit with this particular age progression line? Um, that was our onset for our crews. Um, but before that, the people had only this data in hand, they had to think of another process to explain this. And so on the next slide, we are showing you here a 3D diagram that Jim, or Jim Netland actually published in 1980, where he shows the flexing of the Pacific plate as it is going into or subducting into the Tonga Trench. And you see that it is basically bending towards the left, towards, towards the west. And basi basically it's making a pretty sharp turn over there. And in that turn is causing some kind of a lithospheric flexure upwards where the Samoan Islands are. And also it might be tearing it up, forming all kinds of extensional features uh, in the Pacific Plate. And his reasoning was is that all this young volcanics is observed on the islands actually were formed above a tear or a fracture in the Pacific Plate due to this flexing of the Pacific Plate going down in the trench. So that's a very interesting, uh, different explanation of Nsima Trail. And so that was a little bit the backdrop against which we went out to collect more samples. So in the next slide, Actually, this is 
some images from uh, the cruise that we were doing in 2005, with uh, basically on the Kilimoana, a Hawaiian ship. And on the map, we're basically showing you uh, the track that we did all along this whole Seaman Trail, mostly focused on the younger end in the east, but we also went all the way to the west where we collected samples for the older seamounts. So on the next slide, actually I'm zooming in on one, on one particular case, that's Safai Island. That's the oldest island that's there and that we have all those lead samples from. And in this 3D image, basically, I'm showing you where we collected three samples, or actually where we did three set dredge holes, uh, very deep on the ocean floor at the flank of this really big volcano. So going to the next slide now, these are actually some of the results that we got for this particular island. And this is a typical way that an arc and arc and geochronologist is depicting his data. And so each of those diagrams shows you the amount of argon gas that was released during what we call an incremental heating experiment. What we do is we put a sample in our mass spectrometer, we heat it up with a CO2 laser from very low temperatures to very high temperatures. And with each step we release a little bit of gas, we take that argon gas, we clean that up, and we measure that in our mass spectrometer. And for each of those argon extractions, we're calculating an age. Now, if you got, in the ideal world, if your rock is very homogeneous and has not been disturbed by alteration or weathering or what, whatever kind of other processes that might disturb, disturb it, you would expect that each of those incremental heating steps gives you exactly the same age, we speak. And if that's the case, you would basically get a little block, like it's displayed here, that are all the approximately the same size, but are located uh, in a horizontal plateau. And the, some, the, the stuff that you see here is actually very good data set, data set, because most of the samples are very homogeneous and so, showing you this particular behavior very well. Um, if you look at the panel on the left and in the middle, um, that's actually a sample that's a little bit less ideal because you can see on the left side where the low temperature steps are in this incremental heating, you can actually see that the argon ages are slightly higher. And if you look at the right side of the diagram, you can actually see that the calculated ages are slightly lower. And that's actually what is happening if the sample is a little bit altered. Um, you get a little bit more complex uh, argon-argon H plateau diagram. But if you look at this particular data set and you look at the bottom, uh, basically you look at the samples labeled uh, dredge 115, which is the, the two, in, two in the middle and the one on the bottom left, you actually see that each of those analyses from four different rocks are giving you exactly the same age, like 5.0 something million years. So that's a very reproducible uh, result. Um, and that's actually very good for uh, a Seamount study. So on the next slide, I summarize this in, in a map. And so again, you see Savai in the middle, the gray blob, that's where the island is. And everything in color that's underwater and you can see the very complex shape of this seamount very well here. Um, but then where the red dots are, that's where the samples were taken. And dredge 115 is that sample all the way at the bottom left. It's also the deepest sample. And you can see the ages are very consistent at 5 million years. Way older than whatever was measured on the island of Savai, where the ages are not older than 0.4 million years. If you go a little bit up, the flank, you go to D114, you can see that the age is slightly younger. And the dredge all the way on the other side to the northeast of Zafai uh, is actually uh, in the middle with 4.8 million years. So all the samples that we derived from the submarine expedition that we did in 2005 are decidedly older than, 
than whatever we measured before on the islands. And so in the next slide, um, I come back to that same age progression diagram at the bottom left, the same data, and I just plotted the results for Savai from the submarine portion on top of it. And you can see that in this case, um, now actually we get data that's actually confirming this very simple plate motion model where the plate is moving consistently for 7.1 centimeters per year um, for the Samoan uh, hotspot trail. So that was, that's very exciting. On the next slide, I'm trying to put this result in a, in a tectonic history uh, context. And so what we've done here is I've shown you the location of the Tonga Trench in light gray. That's actually stuff that shape most on the right side of the diagram. I did the same thing for Safai Island. And today, at the present day, you can see that Safai, Safai Island and the Tonga Trench and that bend in that Tonga Trench are very closely related to each other. Um, however, two million years ago, if we reconstruct where the Tonga Trench was located then, you can see it's actually quite uh, a little bit, quite some distance to, to the west, while uh, Savai was actually located slightly to the southeast. Four million years ago, this was this difference was even bigger. You can see the dark gray area is lying quite some ways to the west, while Savai moved over even more to the east. And that's because, of course, the Pacific plate has been moving, you know, with seven centimeters per year, uh, per million year, per year, sorry. Um, and that's taken, in, that's shown here in the movement of Savai with the green arrow. But the Tonga Trench, uh, that particular subduction zone has been experienced quite some rollback. Basically the plate is retreating back towards the east. And it's one of the systems in the world, of the subduction systems in the world, where we have the fastest rollback. So the bottom line here is that five million years ago, when Savai formed most of its submarine volcanics, uh, this island or volcano was about 1,500 kilometers uh, away from the Tonga Trench and basically located squarely inside the Pacific Plate and not at, at the plate tectonic boundary. So based on that, and it's listed in the next slide, um, we came to the following conclusions. Uh, basically, we reinstated Samoa as a, as a typical hotspot and not something that is solely formed by uh, tension in the Pacific Plate. So the new 5 million year shield ages of Zabai, they are conforming to predicted age based on 7.1 centimeter per year plate motion. We know based on the plate tectonic reconstruction that it was decidedly located inside the Pacific Plate. So it's a real true interplate uh, volcano like Hawaii is. And um, the younger volcanism, of course, is still there. You know, that data, that is solid. It's, it's covering all the islands in the Samoan region. And so there's clearly a rejuvenated stage of volcanism going on uh, after the Simon Trail was formed. And so what we now have is not a simple hotspot model, but we have a hybrid model that starts out with mantle plume volcanism first, and then quite later on, uh, followed by um, an extended period of extensional volcanism related to the interaction with the Tonga Trench. So let's go to the next slide and let's also go to another Simon Trail. So let's go to the Louisville Simon Trail. In the beginning, the things that's interesting about Louisville in comparison to Hawaii is, is that actually the um, amount of volcanism output has been reduced with time. So from old to young, the volcanic output has diminished quite a lot. And there are much less seamounts at the young end than there are at the old end. Um, so on the next slide, I'm showing you basically, it's, it's again a blow up of this seamount trail where all the, on, the, on panel A, all the black dots are basically where seamounts or geos are located. 
I will also showing you here in pink four locations where we hope to get drilling done in the near future with IODP and I will tell you a little bit more about that later and in the other panels I'm showing you where we have uh, some of the data and again I will show you that a little bit later too so in the next slide I'm showing you again this age versus distance plot but now for the Louisville and this is from the from a 2004 paper of myself um, and Bob Duncan and, and Bernard Steinberger. And what we've done in this diagram is we've plotted some data that was collected in the 1980s. It's the data that's plotted in the light blue circles. And at that time, that was the best that they could do with their, the current analytical techniques at that time. But they got a very interesting results because they got basically a perfect linear regression line. That's the green line here. And if you calculate an R squared of that, it's way, way better than 0.9 or 0.99 even. So, you know, everybody was quite happy. That was a good example of a linear age progression. Uh, so, a couple of years ago, we decided to take the same samples and redo them, but then with more modern arc and argon dating techniques and using this incremental heating technique. Um, the good thing is that we could reproduce most of this old data. So if you look to the red squares, that's the new data. And basically at the young end, and basically everywhere, it's reproducing the light blue circles pretty well, except in one case. That's all the way at the old end, where there's a big difference, where the, the red squares are jumping up by about 15 million years. Um, we could reproduce that in two samples, so that's a pretty solid result. But of course, it meant that that nice linear age progression, that green line, they didn't hold anymore. And so, basically for the Louisville, we had to come up with a quite a different explanation to uh, fit in those two quite older data points uh, there at the old end of the Louisville Seamount Trail. So in the next slide, I'm showing you two examples again. Again, the age plateaus in the middle are pretty well defined, but you can see that those samples are quite more disturbed than uh, the Samoan examples that I showed you. Uh, on the left side of those diagrams, you can see quite a lot of steps that have apparently old ages up to 160 million years. And at the right ends, you can see we're falling off those plateaus and getting younger ages. But still, this is a pretty good uh, data set and we can reproduce um, those ages pretty well if we do different samples from the same seamount or the same dredge. So on the next slide, um, I'm going basically into some uh, plate motion modeling that we've done with this data set for Louisville. And of course, you know, we talk about Louisville, you immediately talk about Hawaii Emperor as well. And you would like to compare it to that because they both are very similar, right? 70 to 80 million year of volcanism. They both are siding on the Pacific plate. Um, they both show a bend, although the Louisville shows the bend and quite a quite weaker band than the Hawaiian Emperor band is. Um, so we start looking at plate motion models and what I want you to focus on first is this little worm, this colored worm on the right side that starts off uh, on Hawaii. That's data from the models that Bernard Steinberger has been running and that's the motion of the, Pacific, of the Hawaiian hotspot as predicted by his mental flow models. And you can see there's a, quite a significant motion from uh, north to south over 120 million years. And as you will later on learn, is that, that's confirmed with paleomagnetic data. Um, so what we have done in this diagram is we have calculated the plate motion models with two assumptions. One, assuming fixed hotspot, basically ignoring that colored worm of Bernard Steinberger. And one, not ignoring it, but including it in the model. So the black line is basically the fixed hotspot model. The dashed orange line is the model assuming uh, this or allowing the Hawaiian hotspot to move. Interesting thing here is, is that in both cases we can to a first order very well um, fit the shape of the Hawaiian Emperor Sima Trail. You can see there is in particular at the old end, there are some deviations where the black line goes to the left, 
of the Shimon Trail and the orange line goes a little bit to the right. Um, but in general, you can, in both cases, you can come up with a data set or, or a set of rotation poles that would fit this morphology. So we did the same for the Louisville, which is on the next slide. And again, the colored worm on the right is from Bernard Steinberger from his models. You see it's quite different from the worm for Hawaii. And most of the plume motion is from west to east. But if we look at this orange and black lines again, again, to a first order, we can fit the trail pretty well. But the interesting thing is, again, in both cases, either fixed hotspots or including hotspot motion, we can fit it. This is pretty, pretty curious. Um, so then we start looking at the age data again. So on the next slide, for both Hawaiian Emperor and Louisville, I have to hurry up a little bit, I can see here. Uh, but for both Hawaiian Emperor and Louisville, we plotted again a distance against age. Note here that I swapped the horizontal axis around, so the zero distance where the active hotspot is, is now on the left side of the diagram. But again, I've plotted the black and the uh, orange lines, and on top of that, the age data that we have for both Seamount trails. You can see we got quite some more ages for Hawaiian Emperor than we have for Louisville. Um, but still, if you start looking to how well both models fit, you can see that in particular towards the old end, the black line for fixed hotspot model is really deviating a lot from the Hawaiian data. It's going basically to the left of the, the red data points. And if you go look at Louisville, you can see that the black line is actually located to the right side of the data points. Whereas with the f including hotspot motion, we will get um, a tighter fit. And so, so here we can uh, distinguish a little bit and we concluded in that paper is that we definitely need to include uh, hotspot motion if we start looking at uh, uh, absolute plate motion models. So in the next slide, Basically, this is one of the compilations that Bernard Steinberger made based on this mental flow model. And I just want to focus here on, on the left bottom side where there's uh, six different outcomes of his models based on different assumptions, different viscosity profiles, different, basically lots of different assumptions that go in his models. And you can see that for the Louisville, um, you don't get that very decided north-south motion as you see for Hawaii, um, you get more of an east-west or sorry a west-east motion um, for this particular hotspot but depending on the model there's quite some variability. So seeing all those models from Bernard uh, we've been thinking of now how can we study the Louisville in more detail and decide whether you know this is all true. Can we uh, can we see if his models are actually close to the truth or not? So we are hoping, and on the next slide, I've listed this a little bit, we hope to get IODP drilling done uh, in the Louisville. And we hope to do that so we can get really high resolution age dates for this particular Seamount trail. So we can in more detail look at the relative motions between Louisville and Hawaii. We want to get basalt sampled through drilling so we can get payroll latitude data through paleomagnetic measurements. And we can see how the Louisville hotspot has been moving relative to the spin axis of the Earth. But most importantly, we want to test a few hypotheses. And that's basically, we want to see uh, whether the Pacific hotspots have been moving coherently, or whether these hotspots, hotspots have been moving at a similar rate, but showing some hotspot motions that, with respect to each other or whether, you know, the movement of the Hawaiian hotspot is just an isolated event where all the other hotspots are basically much closer to being fixed in the mantle. And so, again, on the next slide, I'm showing you a few maps of a cruise that we did in preparation of drilling uh, the Louisville. So we collected a lot of bathymetric maps, and I'm just showing you this because you can see how complex those seamounts can be in terms of morphology, with big rift zones, 
sometimes they have two centers of volcanism like the one on the bottom left sometimes they're really small sometimes they're really big but anyway it's it's a very interesting Siman trail and we collected lots of uh, dredge samples uh, during this particular cruise so in the next slide I um, just basically want to show you in panel C where we have samples now and that's basically everything that's colored and not black that's where we have samples and um, so basically, I'm going to look at the ARC and ARCAN data for that now. So in the next slide, I'm showing you some unpublished data. And actually, this week I was very busy trying to get some more data uh, for this particular project in the lab. But again, I'm showing you this age distance plot on the left. And on the right, I show you four examples of the kind of uh, incremental heating experiments I'm doing. But as you can see, we're getting on the left if you look at the red uh, diamond, that's the new data from this uh, latest dredging campaign that we've done on the Louisville. And you can see we've, we basically very systematically are filling in the spot and we really are seeing a very systematic uh, age progression, uh, not linear, but uh, a very systematic age progression going on, uh, and which is basically decidedly uh, lying above that green line, that's that uh, that line that I showed you in the previous diagrams um, as well. So that's very exciting and as I said we're collecting more and more data to really um, get as good defined age progressions as possible for Seamount trails. So then my last group of Seamounts I want to discuss shortly are the Gilbert and the Tokelaus. They are in the mid-Pacific. They are aged between 30 and 70 million years. Um, which makes them fall, you know, together with the Hawaiian emperor band that's dated at about 50 million years. And they also show you this nice band. If you look at the Gilbert and the Tokelau in this plot, you can see it's basically like an ice hockey stick. And the short end, that's basically where we think there's an uh, equivalent morphological band, equivalent to the Hawaiian emperor band. So in the next slide, this is a detailed spectrometric map again of the Gilbert Ridge in this case. You see it's, it's located at very old uh, Cretaceous and Jurassic Ocean floor. And you can see the magnetic anomaly patterns that are uh, depicted in gray lines there. There's some major fracture zones going through it, like the Venus fracture zone. Um, but again, you can see the Gilbert Sima Trail very nicely, and it's bending towards the southeast. Um, at some point and then it basically stops to exist. Uh, so we basically decided to go out there with a the ship, collect rocks and look exactly where that band is happening and see if that age is the same as the one for Hawaiian Emperor Band which is 50 million years. And by just quickly glancing at all the ages listed here now you can see there's not one age in this whole map that's even close to 50 million years. So on the next slide, I'm showing you the same Gilbert Ridge that's on the bottom left and also the Tokelaus on the bottom right and the top right. In gray, I show you the outline of the seamounts, and below that, I show you a couple of absolute plate motion models from the literature. And again, if you compare the ages that are plotted here in those maps, and you compare it to the small ages plotted next to those colored lines and uh, next to those tick marks you can see that uh, none of the measured ages are equivalent to the 50 million years of the Hawaiian Emperor Band. On, and then on my last slide, on, on my last slide, or one to last basically, again, you know, the same trick, plotting ages against distance along the Simon Trail. Uh, if you look not to the inset, but to the general diagram, uh, there's red squares, there is blue circles. Well, the blue circles, you can see they are way old. They, Ava and Sakao are about 75 to 80 million years old. That's some other volcanism unrelated to that trail. And Seika is 115 million years old. Very unrelated. So I'm just ignoring that in the inset. The point I want to make in the inset is, is if you would calculate an age progression for the Tokelaus or the Gilberts in this case, you get 
96 millimeters per year if you just take the oldest data, that's the purple dashed line. Or if you take all data, it's 131 millimeters per year. Lots of scatter, but if you just ignore the scatter, just calculate a line, that's the age progression or the speed that you get. If you compare that to whatever absolute plate motion model that's published, that speed is way too high and not uh, compatible with those models at all. So the big question is, with the Gilbert Ridge and the Tokal houses, why are the bands dated at a different time, sometimes up to 20 million years before the Hawaiian Emperor band appeared in the Hawaiian Emperor Trail? Uh, that's a very difficult question. Uh, hotspot motion most likely is not involved, but other processes, secondary processes like extension or rejuvenation um, of that seamount trail might actually be in play in disturbing this particular seamount trail. So in my final slide, just some, some last words um, about argon argon dating and seamount ages. Basically it's mixed bag. You know, whenever we go out to another seamount trail, we are seeing or learning quite so, something new. Um, there are some first order conclusions or observations that you can make and that most seamount trails they show you a consistent younging from the expected older end to their younger end. Uh, however, not all of the age progressions are linear. Well, I've shown you that. And um, so in some cases that means that you could adjust the classical hotspot model a little bit by including uh, plume motions like for Hawaii or Louisville. However, in other cases, um, you have to include something else like plate extension or stress-induced volcanism or overprinting. And in even other cases, you have to have a hybrid model where you start out with a simple hotspot model but have a big overprint happening uh, later on, like I showed for Samoa or uh, for the Gilbert Ridge. So I think I'll leave it at that and I'm run over time, but thanks a lot for listening.